The Four Million, The Love Filter of Icky Schoenstein by O. Henry. The blue light drugstore is downtown, between the Bowery and First Avenue, where the distance between the two streets is the shortest. The blue light does not consider that pharmacy is a thing of bric-a-brac, scent and ice cream soda. If you ask it for painkiller, it will not give you a bonbon. The blue light scorns the labor-saving arts of modern pharmacy. It macerates its opium and percolates its own laudanum and paragoric. To this day, pills are made behind its tall prescription desk, pills rolled out on its own pill tile, divided with a spatula, rolled with a finger and thumb, dusted with calcine magnesia and delivered in little round pasteboard pillboxes. The store is on a corner about which coveys of ragged, plumed, hilarious children play and become candidates for the cough drops and soothing syrups that wait for them inside. Icky Schoenstein was the night clerk of the blue light and the friend of his customers. Thus it is on the east side, where the heart of pharmacy is not glacé. There, as it should be, the druggist is a counselor, a confessor, an advisor, an able and willing missionary and mentor whose learning is respected whose occult wisdom is venerated and whose medicine is often poured untasted into the gutter. Therefore, Icky's corniform, bespectled nose and narrow, knowledge-bowed figure was well known in the vicinity of the blue light, and his advice and notice were much desired. Icky roomed and breakfasted at Mrs. Riddle's two squares away. Mrs. Riddle had a daughter named Rosie. The circumlocution has been in vain. You must have guessed it. Icky adored Rosie. She tinctured all his thoughts. She was the compound extract of all that was chemically pure and official. The dispensatory contained nothing equal to her. But Icky was timid, and his hopes remained insoluble in the menstruum of his backwardness and fears. Behind his counter was a superior being, calmly conscious of special knowledge and worth. Outside he was a weak-kneed, purblind, motorman-cursed rambler, with ill-fitting clothes stained with chemicals, and smelling of socotrin aloes and valerinate of ammonia. The fly in Icky's ointment, thrice welcome, Pat Trope, was Chunk McGowan. Mr. McGowan was also striving to catch the bright smiles tossed about by Rosie, but he was no outfielder as Icky was. He picked them off the bat. At the same time, he was Icky's friend and customer, and often dropped in at the Blue Light Drug Store to have a bruise painted with iodine or get a cut rubber plastered after a pleasant evening spent along the Bowery. One afternoon McGowan drifted in in his silent easy way and sat, comely, smooth-faced, hard, indomitable, good-natured upon a stool. Icky said he, when his friend had fetched his mortar and sat opposite, grinding gum benzoine to a powder, get busy with your ear. It's drugs for me if you've got the line I need. Icky scanned the countenance of Mr. McGowan for the usual evidences of conflict, but found none. Take off your coat, he ordered. I guess already that you have been stuck in the ribs with a knife. I have many times told you those dagos would do you up. Mr. McGowan smiled. Not them, he said. Not any dagos. But you've located the diagnosis all right enough. It's under my coat, near the ribs. Say, Icky, Rosie and me are going to run away and get married tonight. Icky's left forefinger was doubled over the edge of the mortar, holding it steady. He gave it a wild rap with the pestle, but felt it not. Meanwhile, Mr. McGowan's smile faded to a look of perplexed gloom. That's it, he continued. If she keeps in the notion until the time comes, we've been laying pipes for a getaway for two weeks. One day she says she will, the same evening she says Nixie. We've agreed on tonight and Rosie stuck to the affirmative this time for two whole days, but it's five hours yet till the time, and I'm afraid she'll stand me up when it comes to the scratch. You said you wanted drugs, remarked Icky. Mr. McGowan looked ill at ease and harassed, a condition opposed to his usual line of demeanor. He made a patent medicine almanac into a roll and fitted it with unprofitable carefulness about his finger. I wouldn't have had this double handicap make a false start tonight for a million, he said. I've got a little flat up in Harlem already, with chrysanthemums on the table and a kettle ready to boil, and I've engaged a pulpit pounder to be ready at his house for us at 9.30. It's got to come off, and if Rosie don't change her mind again, Mr. McGowan ceased, pray to his doubts. I don't see then yet, said Icky shortly. What makes it that you talk of drugs, 
or what I can be doing about it. Old man Riddle don't like me a little bit, went on the uneasy suitor, bent upon marshalling his arguments. For a week he hasn't let Rosie step outside the door with me. If it wasn't for losing a border, they'd have bounced me long ago. I'm making twenty dollars a week, and she'll never regret flying the coop with Chunk McGowan. You will excuse me, Chunk, said Icky. I must make a prescription that is to be called for soon. Say, said McGowan, looking up suddenly. Say, Icky, ain't there a drug of some kind? Some kind of powders that'll make a girl like her better if you give them to her? Icky's lip beneath his nose curled with the scorn of superior enlightenment. But before he could answer, McGowan continued. Tim Lacey told me he got some ones from a croaker uptown and fed him to his girl in soda water. From the very first doses, he was ace high and everybody else looked like thirty cents to her. They was married in less than two weeks. Strong and simple was Chunk McGowan. A better reader of men than Icky was could have seen that his tough frame was strung upon fine wires. Like a good general who was about to invade the enemy's territory, he was seeking to guard every point against possible failure. I thought, went on Chunk hopefully, that if I had one of them powders to give Rosie when I see her at supper tonight, it might brace her up and keep her from reneging on the proposition to skip. I guess she don't need a mule team to drag her away, but women are better at coaching than they are at running bases. If the stuff will work for just a couple of hours, it'll do the trick. When is this foolishness of running away to be happening? asked Icky. Nine o'clock, said Mr. McGowan. Supper at seven. At eight, Rosie goes to bed with a headache. At nine, old Parvenzano lets me through to his backyard, where there's a board off Riddle's fence next door. I go under her window and help her down the fire escape. You've got to make it early on the preacher's account. It's all dead easy if Rosie don't balk when the flag drops. Can you fix me one of them powders, Icky? Icky Schoenstein rubbed his nose slowly. Chunk, said he, it is of drugs of that nature that pharmaceutists must have much carefulness. To you alone of my acquaintance would I entrust a powder like that, but for you I shall make it, and you shall see how it makes Rosie to think of you. Icky went behind the prescription desk. There he crushed to a powder two soluble tablets, each containing a quarter of a grain of morphia. To them he added a little sugar of milk to increase the bulk, and folded the mixture neatly into a white paper. Taken by an adult, this powder would ensure several hours of heavy slumber without danger to the sleeper. This he handed to Chunk McGowan, telling him to administer it in a liquid if possible, and receive the hearty thanks of the backyard Lochinvar. The subtlety of Icky's action becomes apparent upon recital of his subsequent move. He sent a messenger for Mr. Riddle, and disclosed the plans of Mr. McGowan for eloping with Rosie. Mr. Riddle was a stout man, brick dusty of complexion and sudden in action. Much obliged, he said briefly to Ikey, the lazy Irish loafer. My own room's just above Rosie's. I'll just go up there myself after supper and load the shotgun and wait. If he comes in my backyard, he'll go away in an ambulance instead of a bridal chase. With Rosie held in the clutches of Morpheus for a many hours' deep slumber, and the bloodthirsty parent waiting, armed and forewarned, Icky felt that his rival was close indeed upon discomfiture. All night in the blue light drug store he waited at his duties for chance news of the tragedy, but none came. At eight o'clock in the morning the day clerk arrived and Icky started hurriedly for Mrs. Riddle's to learn the outcome, and lo, as he stepped out of the store who but Chunk McGowan sprang from a passing streetcar and grasped his hand. Chunk McGowan with a victor's smile and flushed with joy. Pulled it off, said Chunk with Elysium in his grin. Rosie hit the fire escape on time to a second and we was under the wire at the reverend's at nine-thirty and a quarter. She's up at the flat. She cooked eggs this morning in a blue kimono. Lord, how lucky I am. You must pace up some day, Ikey, and feed with us. I've got a job down near the bridge, and that's where I'm heading for now. The, the, the powder, stammered Ikey. Oh, that stuff you gave me, said Chunk, broadening his grin. Well, it was this way. I sat down at the supper table last night at Riddle's, and I looked at Rosie, and I says to myself, Chunk? If you get the girl, get her on the square. Don't try any hocus-pocus with a thoroughbred like her. And I keeps the paper you give me in my pocket. And then my lamps fall on another party present. Who, I say to myself, is failing in a proper affection toward his coming son-in-law. So I watches my chance and dumps that powder in old man Riddle's coffee. See? End of the Love Filter of Icky Schoenstein